Questions? Okay. So let me say a few words about then um, projection methods. Okay. Okay, so the idea, remember from yesterday's introduction, is that we are still looking for our functional equation H where the unknown is the function D, the stack of all the decision rules and all the functions in the model. And it's going to be equal to a functional zero. And basically what projection methods do is they say, well, we are going to approximate the unknown decision rules by a linear combination of some basis functions given some coefficients. Okay? So the rule of the game is going to be to pick a good basis and to determine how to project the unknown decision rule into that basis. And that's why these things are called projection. Okay? Now, the beautiful, absolutely beautiful thing about projection methods is that D can be anything you want. It can be a decision rule for the agents, but it can be a value function. So you can solve value, in the same way that you can use perturbation methods to solve value functions, you can also use projection methods to solve for value functions. So all the arguments, like maybe the value function is better behaved at the equilibrium condition, will also go through here. Or expectations. And this is actually something very cute, because sometimes the expectation is a much smoother object, the conditional expectation, is a much smoother object than uh, the value function directly. Okay? Imagine that I go out there and uh, I try, I don't know, I try to find a job. So I can either get the job or not get the job. So the value function, if I get the job, will be here. The value function, if I don't get the job, will be over here. Okay? So you have a discontinuity over there. But if I'm thinking about my choice with respect to tomorrow, and I'm integrating over the probabilities of getting or not getting a job, the expectation may be perfectly smooth. Okay? So there may be cases where what you want to approximate is an expectation. Uh, in general, we would like to have the same number of coefficients theta than basis functions. Okay? Uh, you could do things that are not different from linear combinations, but those are kind of odd. And again, we could do nonlinear combinations. I know that in engineering these days, they are really studying a lot nonlinear combinations, and they seem to be making progress. I think that we as economists, we are not quite there yet. Uh, although, I just feel in a grand proposal with a couple of crazy engineers from Urbana, uh, from Illinois, Urbana Champaign, who promised me that they are going to teach me everything I need to know about modern dynamic programming. So maybe in a couple of years, I will tell you otherwise. But so far, I don't know it. <laughs> anyway, so basic algorithm is going to be very, very simple. Okay? So as I was saying before, you pick your basis functions. Okay? And uh, the basis functions are going to go from the state space, so the different values that the states can take into Rm, where you know, m is the number of decision rules that you are picking. And we are going to have n of those. We are going to have this vector of parameters theta, and what I was saying before, we are going to define this approximation of order n, where n, remember, is the number of basis functions we are picking, is just the linear combination of these basis functions. Then what we do is we plug in this approximation, this parameterized approximation, into the operator, h, into the equilibrium conditions, or into the value function, or into you know, whatever setup your problem is given you, and that will give us a residual equation. Okay? So remember before, h is equal to the functional zero. But when we don't evaluate at d, but at dn, it will not be equal to zero. Well, maybe you know, if we are lucky, but you know, in general, it will not be equal to zero. So we are going to have a residual. So the argument is going to be, well, find the value of these parameters theta, that make the residual as close to zero given some objective function. So there are basically here two dimensions that you can pick. 
One dimension is which basis functions you want to pick. And the second dimension is which metric you want to select to minimize your residual. OK? And now, of course, you know, people need to publish papers. So there are dozens of proposals for basis functions and dozens of proposals for metrics. So you, know, you have dozens times dozens. That means a lot of different methods. Okay? I'm going to concentrate, though, on the ones that are more useful and that have been found over time to work better. Okay? Uh, for those of you who have some inclination towards econometrics, this is going to look a lot like ordinary least square because ordinary least square is a projection. Okay? I don't know. You know. Some of you may have even had a class in econometrics where they, you know, they tell you that you are projecting. But another way to think about this is this is my object of interest, my con the conditional expectation of y on x. I don't know what this thing is, so let me approximate it as a linear combination, sorry, this should be x, as the linear combination of monomials on x. And the way I'm going to select these ones is to minimize the distance between the observed y's and the observed x, well, the square of them. So what is the unknown object now? What is the unknown functional equation? The conditional expectation. Remember, conditional expectations are functions. What is my basis? The monomials in x. What is the criterion I'm going to use? This is square. I'm going to minimize the square of the residuals. So OLS, you know, all fashion OLS is just projection. And there is actually a really, really super cool literature on something called semi-non-parametric methods, or semi, I never know if it's one or the other, which is basically the idea that we are going to, parts of the model are going to be fully parametric, but other parts of the model are going to be fully non-parametric. And we are going to approximate this non-parametric part as basically we are going to pick a bunch of basis functions and we are going to project them in the right way. Uh, Xian Hong Shen at NYU has, is the leader in that literature. Uh, these type of things are called sieves because they have, well, they look like a sieve. Well, anyway, I don't want to get into that. And, uh, and she has a very nice uh, handbook chapter in the Handbook of Econometrics about these things. So if any of you is interested, these things are super cool. Also, there are two methods that people use out there in the literature in economics that you may have seen. One is called policy iteration, and the other one is called parameterized expectations. You can show that both of them are particular cases of projection for some particular basis functions and some particular metric. Okay? So in that sense, the good thing about thinking about this as projection in general terms is that it's, of course, much easier for us to understand the general structure and you know, to work through theorems and things like that that may be hidden in very particular applications and in the details. You know, after all, that's why functional analysis was invented, to abstract from irrelevant details. OK. So there are basically two ways in which you can pick a basis. You can go to a global basis, which is basically a basis that is defined all over the space, or a local basis, which is a basis that is defined only in a very small subset. The first type of global basis, they are also called spectral methods. Uh, no idea why, but hey, it sounds really cool. And uh, local basis, they are also called finite element methods. Okay? And then, of course, how do we project? So there are many, many spectral bases. The great advantage that they have is simplicity. Okay? You don't need to worry too much about uh, you know, mm, corners and things like that, and you know, being sure that the different pieces of the approximation get together, glue together. The problem they have is that they have a very difficult time in capturing local behavior. So imagine, and this is related with the Gibbs phenomenon that some of you may know from Fourier analysis. So imagine that this is your decision rule. And forever the reason it has a bump over there. Global methods really try to approximate this globally, so they are going to have a really, really hard problem handling a very small local 
irregularity. Okay? The reason why I was relating this with Fourier analysis is, you know that in Fourier analysis you are basically using sines and cosines to approximate regular functions. Imagine this is a function you can approximate, a step function. Okay? The problem is that doing this with sine and cosines, when you get to this point, you are going to overshoot like this. And even if you go to extremely high levels of approximation, where this is going to be nearly flat, right at this point, where there is this local change of behavior, you are going to have these big overshoots. This is called the Gibbs phenomenon, because Gibbs was the first person to point it out. Okay? Well, something like that is what is going to happen over here. If you have, for whatever the reason, some local behavior, the global method is going to have a hard time capturing it. On the other hand, if it is a smooth and nice policy function, like the one generated by uh, the neoclassical growth model or by your favorite neo-Keynesian model, then these spectral methods are going to do a great job. Okay. There are many, many bases. I'm not going to go over them in the interest of time. Just let me you know, kick out from your mind the idea of using monomials. Very bad idea. Okay? The main reason, well, I talk over there, I say a lot of many uh, long words, x to the power of 10 and x to the power of 11, plotted in your computer, they look exactly the same. This is multicollinearity. Not exact multicollinearity, but nearly multicollinearity. So monomials, bad idea. Don't use monomials. Well, cosines and sines, come on, we are not uh, in regular things. Okay, the most general type of polynomials that you like to use are what sometimes are called the Jacobi polynomials of the Jacobi type. And the reason why they are great is because they are orthogonal. So the reason, so think about when we are doing regression, what is the way to get the maximum bank for the back in a regression if our two regressors are really very uncorrelated because that really gives us a lot of information. Well, what more uncorrelatedness than orthogonality? Okay? As I always tell people, orthos means straight, gonos means angle, so something like that cannot get much uh, more different. Now, the great thing about the Jacobi polynomials, that they have this kind of uh, general formula, is that they are, if you go to the math department or your, in your university, you will find dozens and dozens of textbooks written about them. So there is really a lot that is known about them. In particular, for the case where we have this alpha beta equal to zero in this implicit definition of the orthogonality condition, we have one particular version of them who are called Chebyshev polynomials. So Chebyshev polynomials are a particular type of the orthogonal Jacobi type. Let me, I'll come back to this in just one second. No, I don't have that formula over here. Let me skip this. So, for the next few minutes, I'm going to fully concentrate then on Chebyshev polynomials. Okay? A very, very nice, two very, very nice books, Chebyshev and Fourier Spectral Methods by John Boyd, and A Practical Guide to Pseudo-Spectral Methods. You will see that pseudo-spectral methods are a subset of spectral methods. Two very nice textbooks, very easy to understand. Okay? Okay, so Chebyshev polynomials are great because of many reasons. We already argued that they are orthogonal, but we have many single closed form expressions. Uh, we know a lot about them. They are very robust when we interpolate them. Uh, they are bounded between minus one and one. They are smooth. And we know very well how to switch between the coefficients of a Chebyshev expansion and the values of the function implied by those. Okay, so we can do a lot of move between uh, things. So how are they defined? Let me show you, okay, I have it over here. Let me show you, maybe the easiest way is to see the recursive formulation and then, you know, a few polynomials. So the first Chebyshev polynomial is one, is the constant. Well, the zero Chebyshev polynomial. The first Chebyshev polynomial is x. The polynomial n plus one is two x, tn minus tn minus one. You see why this is recursive? Because I specify the first two, and after that, it's just a combination of the previous two. 
And what you will have is 1x to x squared minus 1, 4x cubed minus 3x, and so on and so forth. Let me show you a few of those polynomials. And we will start to see a lot of very interesting properties. Well, the first one is just a constant. They are defined between minus 1 and 1. Uh, that's great. Uh, order 1 is just a constant. It's just a straight line between minus 1 and 1. Polynomial of order 2, polynomial of order 3, polynomial of order 4, polynomial of order 5, and so on and so forth. Okay. So things that you will note. How many times does the polynomial of order 1 cross 0? 1. Well, and the polynomial of order 0, 0. How many times order 2? Two? 2. How many times 3? Three? 3. 4, 4, 5, 5. So that's great. Not a big surprise, though, by the way we define them. But something that perhaps is more interesting is look at this. So we have two crosses over here, two crosses over here, but only one in the middle. As we go high in the order of the polynomial, the crosses at the zero tend to accumulate, tend to cluster at a quadratic rate at the borders of this uh, minus one, one, which looks like a bad thing because you say, hey, I really care about the middle, but it's actually great. Because in some sense, later on, we will argue that when you are doing these global approximations, what you want to do is get the frontiers right, and then the middle will take care of itself. So the fact that the zeros of the Chebyshev polynomial cluster asymptotically towards minus 1 and 1 is a great property of Chebyshev polynomials. Oh. And, in fact, the Chebyshev polynomial, the zeros are just given by that simple expression. Again, 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 the great thing about having these very, very simple expressions is that doing all this in MATLAB is going to be really very simple. Well, not that simple, but relatively simple. Okay. You also have an explicit definition. You actually have five different explicit definitions. I'm not going to go over all of those, but anyway. Okay. Chebyshev interpolation theorem. This is really super cool result. Okay. Imagine that we are approximating the function exactly at the roots of the polynomial, at the zeros of the polynomial. So imagine that we are doing a fourth, a projection with a fourth order Chebyshev polynomial, and we get the function to be exactly, the residual function, sorry, to be exactly zero at those four roots of the polynomial. And then we do the same with five, and then we do the same with six, and with seven, and so on and so forth. What the Chebyshev interpolation theorem tells you is that as the number of these roots goes to infinity, you are approximating the function arbitrarily well in the whole domain. And that's what I was trying to tell you before. If you are able to get the Chebyshev polynomials to do a good job at the roots, the rest of the function will take care of itself. You don't need to worry about that. And that's going to motivate actually one of the ways we are going to project. Questions about this? Yes. Okay. I'm not quite sure it's soup. For sure it's L2. Uh, soup. Is the soup norm as well? Okay. Okay. Into the corners, that actually goes fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't sure if in the sup norm will work or not. I, I knew for sure. I mean, in L2 is trivial to show, but in, in, in sup I didn't remember. Okay. Now, something I haven't really said, and because of time constraints, I will not able to say much, is about... Uh, all these Chebyshev polynomials are defined in one dimension. But, you know, the real problem is that in life we are going to have a state, 
spaces with many, many dimensions. So one very trivial possibility could be, we are really running out of paper, but I will ask, see if I can get a little bit more in the, during the break. One possibility will be to say, well, let me define a polynomial in KZ as just the Chebyshev in K and the Chebyshev in C. Okay? But this is going to have a problem. So imagine that I want to get a fourth order on this thing. So I will have first order in K, first order in C. Second order in K, first order in C. Three, one, four, one. But then I will have one, two, 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 three, two, four, two, and so on and so forth. I will have 16. So something that was relatively easy, which is to handle four, becomes a little bit harder in two dimensions because it's 16. Imagine that we have three dimensions. We will have 64. Imagine we have one more dimension. It will be, what, 256. Very soon, as soon as you have five, six dimensions, it's just going to be impossible to handle. OK, this is just the course of dimensionality. Okay? And it's a pain because you know, if you want to solve a model, as I was saying before, with, I don't know, 20 state variables, it's going to make your life really, really hard. So what can you do? Well, there are two things. Basically, there is one thing you can do uh, beyond getting a bigger computer, which is to say, you know, probably if I already have 2, 2, and 4, 2, 3, 2 is not going to be that useful. Okay? So one thing, for example, I can do is to eliminate a lot of these cross terms that are not adding that much new information. And there is a whole literature about how to do this efficiently. Because of time constraints, I'm not going to be able to talk about the best way I know of, which is to use something that is called a smoliac. Let me see. Okay. So the Smolyak algorithm, which is uh, explained over there, but is much better explained than in my notes in a paper by Felix Kubler and uh, Der Kruger in the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, is just basically a way to keep out of these 16 possible combinations only a very few of them. And um, I even have a table over here where if you follow the rules of a Smolyak interpolation. Okay, so imagine that you had, for example, a 12 a state variables and you wanted to do a fifth order approximation. This will be how many polynomials you will need if you were keeping everything, while if you do a Smolyak, you will only need 313. Okay, and you can see this is. Well, six orders of magnitude smaller. Okay? So today I'm going to keep talking about uh, unidimensional problems because at the end of the day, you know, the math and the intuition is the same that in multidimensional. The only thing about multidimensional problems is what do you do to reduce the course of dimensionality. In the case of productivity, for the basic RBC where you only have capital and productivity, it's actually relatively simple because what you can do is you can use Tauken's procedure, which is just a way to discretize the productivity shock in maybe high, low, middle, or really, really high, high, middle, low, and really low. And then what you do is literally you solve the Chebyshev polynomial for each of the five possible combinations of productivity. So it's much easier to handle. Okay? But this is a little bit what we do over there. Now, um, Smolyak, Smolyak. Okay. So this is the way that John Boyd, the guy I showed you before, finishes his textbook. And is the first of his moral principles are when in doubt, use Chebyshev polynomials unless the solution is especially periodic. Since that doesn't happen in economics, we may forget about the rest of the sentence. Uh, unless you are sure another set of basis function is better, use Chebyshev polynomials. And the third is, unless you are really, really sure another set of basis function is better, use Chebyshev polynomials. Okay? So very well behaved. I saw you already some Euler equations errors before that they deliver very, very great performance. 
very stable numerically, a lot of very nice properties. Really, the main problem in practical implementation is when you have high level of a state, uh, how many, many dimensions, how you eliminate some of the cross terms. A small yak algorithm gives you a nice way to do it. So I just finished a paper with um, Pablo Guerron at the Philadelphia Fed and Juan Rubio at Duke, where we solve a neo Keynesian model using Chebyshev polynomials. And I think we have 12 dimensions. And we use a small yak, and we are able to compute that. And yes, we want to solve it globally. There is a reason we want to do that. OK. Then let me very briefly talk about finite elements. So finite elements is one of these things that when they first came about, a lot of people got very excited. But I think that we have slowed down a little bit to them. I think that people now seem to be less into them. And basically, the argument is that instead of defining the uh, function over the whole state space, we are just going to define it overly over a small portion of it. So imagine that capital can go between 0 to capital bar. So what I'm going to do is that one of my basis functions is going to be like this. So it's going to be 0 nearly everywhere, except in this place. And then my second basis function is going to be like this. So 0 over here, and then 0, and so on and so forth, period by period. Uh, sorry. So in any given chunk of the space, there are only going to be two of these functions that are going to be different from 0. And then it's going to be exactly the same as before, or approximation is just going to be the linear combination of all these things. So this will be phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, okay? which ensures that the whole thing is continuous and well behaved. What is the great thing about this? It's going to be great at handling very local properties. Okay? Because basically, what imagine that, remember the example before where I have this small bump over here? Finite elements only will need to move a little bit phi 3, phi 3 to try to get that right. Doesn't need to worry about what is happening over here. What is the problem of global basis? I want to capture this thing. Since I have the Chebyshev polynomials, to change a little bit the behavior over here, I need to change everything at the same time. But finite elements, I'm only picking a very, very small subset. So that's why uh, in natural sciences and in engineering, they use finite elements a lot. Okay, so the best example, uh, my dad is an aerospace engineer, so I always feel obliged uh, to make some example from engineering. So designing the wing of a plane is the most complicated part of the whole process. And the reason is because the turbulences are very different. You just move a few centimeters to one direction or the other, they are very different. So you really need finite element methods to have a whole model of the differential equation over there and capture this very small local behavior. Otherwise, you know, the plane will fall and it will not be pretty. It's not good for business. Okay? Another, <laughs> believe it or not, when I was a graduate student, I have a very, very good friend at 3M in Minnesota. And uh, she was the boss of the group doing finite element analysis for diapers. Because diapers are designed using finite elements to be absolutely sure that they maximize absorption level, which also has a lot of local properties. Okay? So really important things in life, like planes and diapers, are designed with finite elements. In macro, you know, Ellen McGrattan has a paper. I had a paper using finite elements. I haven't seen that many people picking on them. And I think that the reason, and this is just my personal view, is that remember some of the earlier equation errors I showed you before? You don't get such an amazing result in comparison with the pain that it represents to code this thing, unless it's a problem where you really have a complicated boundary and finite elements will help you to handle it, it very well. So let me show you what I mean by that. So imagine that one great thing about finite elements is imagine that the set of acceptable state values has something like this. 
Okay, for whatever the reason, I don't know. This is not feasible because it will violate some uh, incentive constraint. Okay, type of problems like this uh, show up with incentive constraints. So with finite elements, well, by the way, finite elements, this will be like pieces in a linear thing, but when you are doing in two dimensions, it will be like tiles. Okay, and that's, by the way, the reason why this is called finite element, because you define an element which is finite. So if you are doing that in two dimensions, You can do a very, fa very small finite ele uh, elements over here to capture well the behavior close to this funky frontier. And then over here, you can just define many big elements without too much worry. And the good thing is that there is nothing in finite elements that tells me that the elements need to be symmetric or the same size. In fact, they can be very, very different. And that's the type of things why this works so well in physics or in engineering problems. Because they will do a very good approximation here where they really, really need it, and they will care less about what is going on over here. Okay? Now, doing this type of things, I think, in economics is difficult. We don't know that much about it, so that's why I think it hasn't really picked up. But, you know, it's something that is good to keep in mind if people want to use it in the future. Uh, yeah, let me not say much about it. Oh, yes, but let me say something about... Um, one great thing about finite elements is that you can, it's very easy to do, to do refinements with them. What I mean by that is that once you have an approximation to the, your solution with, let's say, 50 elements, you can say, let me use this as initial guess for an approximation with 60 elements. And what you can do is be smart about where you subdivide some of the existing elements in smaller ones. Okay? And there is a lot of information in the Euler equation error about where you want to do it. So, for example, there is something called the H refinement, which is to subdivide each element into smaller elements to improve resolution uniformly. So you just make everything smaller. R, R refinement, that is to identify areas with high nonlinearities and just refine over there. Or P refinement, which is just to introduce more bases. Okay, and there is, if you, if you follow the literature in finite elements, there is kind of long discussions about, you know, when you want to do each of the two of the three and how to combine them efficiently and so on and so forth. Again, uh, this is really an introduction to the material. Uh, if I had more time, I could explain more about it. Okay. So, you know, let me recap for a second. What we did so far was to argue, look, we have these projection methods and... Uh, we can either pick Chebyshev polynomials as a global basis, or we can pick finite elements, subdivide our problem in small pieces, and pick these linear functions. And by the way, that's the reason why, especially if you go to a little bit older books from the 50s and the 60s, instead of projection, they will call this minimum or uh, minimum weighted residual method. Okay, because you are going to take this weighted residual and minimize it. And in fact, that was the, the way it was known at the beginning. As this was developed during the 1930s. Okay. So the idea basically is we are going to define a weight function. And what is going to happen is, so we have this residual that, remember, is a function. We are going to weight it. And we want to make that integral of the residual with respect to the weight equal to zero. And that will give us one, sorry, zero, or one otherwise. So this basically means I want to, the way I'm going to select my parameters, sorry, that was, a, that was not a very good explanation. What this just means is I want to select the parameters theta in my approximation such that the integral of the residual function given my weight function is equal to zero for each of the n weight functions I'm going to select. Okay? Remember, I have n parameters to determine. We have n basis functions, so now what I need to do is pick n weight functions. You see? And then, well, in practice, this is just equal to solving this system of equations. You are going to have the residual function evaluated at theta, and then the integral with respect to the weight function, you are going to have n of those, so you are going to have n of those equations. And solving that system of n equations will give you the n thetas, and you will have your approximation. 
So which objective functions we can pick? Well, one is what is known as the least square, which is just the derivative of the residual function with respect to theta. This will be the condition. And the reason why this is called least square is because this equation is just the first order condition of this minimization of the quadratic residual, which is you know, the ordinary least squares from econometrics. Uh, this is a variational problem. Well, that's not that interesting in this situation. It doesn't work that well numerically. Okay, when you have many states and you have many coefficients, it's a difficult problem to handle. You need to compute this integral. You need to take this derivative. How do you take the derivative of a function you don't even know exactly? It's only an evaluation. A uh, lot of problems. Let me skip some domain. Let me skip moments. These are just things. This is much more interesting. This is collocation. So in collocation, what you are going to say is, let me pick the simplest possible weight function that I can imagine, which is a Dirac. It's going to be 1 in some point and 0 everywhere else. So the system that we had before, instead of being this very complicated integral with this weight function, is simply to compute, let me see if I have a, a ch -ch 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 -ch, no. It's simply to pick endpoints and then to solve the residual function in all these endpoints. Okay, it's a system of n equations and n unknowns, doesn't even have an integral, so much easier. Well, happens to be the case that there is a very smart way to select these collocation points which is the zeros of the Chebyshev polynomial. And this is what sometimes, uh, over there I have yes, a little bit more of a general discussion, but it's, it's not needed now. And this is what uh, is sometimes called orthogonal collocation or pseudo-spectral. Okay? So this is absolutely, in some sense, is absolutely straightforward. You just pick your... Um, so if you are doing, for example, an approximation up to fifth order, you will just find the fifth, sorry, the five zeros of the Chebyshev polynomial of order five. You will evaluate the residual function in those five points, and you will just solve that system of equations. So it's very, very simple. Okay. Let's look at how this works in, la in real life. Oops, no, 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 let me... I will come to Galerkin in just one second, don't worry. But let me show you some MATLAB. Okay. Now we need to change a little bit. Okay. So I have some code to solve a whole RBC, but as I was looking at it the other day, I figured it out it was a little bit complicated. Uh, has many things. For what I want to teach you today, Let's imagine that we have the simplest possible functional equation over there. This will get all the points across with much less pain. Which is d prime of x plus d of x equal to 0. Okay? And we need to find what d of x is. Of course, it's just going to be the exponential, not a big surprise over there. But anyway, and we are going to do it between 0 and 6, and the boundary condition is going to be that d evaluated at 0 is equal to 1. Okay? So let's look at the structure of this code. First, let's do some basic housekeeping. We clear the memory, we close all the windows, tick, you know, the expression tick-tock is just to measure time. Okay. Very important point. 
since we need to solve a system of equations, you need to fit some initial values for the optimization, for, for the numerical solver uh, to find the solution. Unfortunately, this requires a certain amount of care. Okay, in the sense that if you don't give good initial values, it's not going to converge. I will talk in a second about iterative methods to minimize that problem, but stay with me for a second. Okay? So what I'm going to guess, I'm going to do an approximation of order 3 over here, I think. So I'm going to, an approximation of order 3, uh, three means that I have four polynomials, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So I need four initial guesses, 0.4, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0 0.1. Fine, they happen to work. Okay. And then A is equal to 0, B is equal to 6. These are just going to be the boundaries. Okay. So how do we solve this? Well, the first thing I need to do is I want to know what my collocation points are. So I have a function, call points, over here. This is a very simple function that just uses, you pass A and B, as the frontiers of your Chebyshev polynomial, and n is the number of collocation points you want. And it's going to compute the zeros. This is the vectorial computation, notice that. So y is going to be, give me the zeros of the Chebyshev polynomial. The second line, the only thing is doing it is rescaling it, in the sense that Chebyshev polynomials are be between minus 1 and 1, but this problem is defined between 0 and 6. Well, I just do an affine transformation. Okay? So this thing again, inputs A and B and N, A and B are the frontiers, N is the number of Chebyshev polynomials. The order of the Chebyshev polynomials. So what I did over here, I'm going to do four, so I just ask A and B. Now, these are just options for the optimization, and what I have is that F solve, F solve is a function in MATLAB that solves for, numeric, for equations, solves uh, systems of nonlinear equations numerically. And what I'm telling it is to search for it in nonlinear. That's where my function is going to be defined. Okay. Now, note that in the way I code, I really like to have all these modular functions, which are very easy to substitute for different applications. And the reason I like to do that is because these modular structures will be very useful later on when you work and do more research on that area, to be able to recycle a lot of your previous code. Okay? You really want to recycle code. You don't want to start from scratch every single time. Okay, so let's look at nonlinear. Nonlinear, I pass theta is the argument, x is going to be uh, where we evaluate it, a and b are the frontiers. It's just a call to residual. Okay, so we jump to residual. And residual is the following. Well, I need to take the derivative of D, of this approximation that we are doing it. I don't want to take derivatives. I may make a mistake. So I'm going to take advantage of MATLAB being smart enough to take derivatives, symbolic derivatives for me. Well, you need to have the MATLAB toolbox, the mathematics toolbox, the symbolic mathematics toolbox, but you know, most university systems have it anyway. Seems as v just defines v as a symbolic variable, not as a numerical variable. So diff chef approx is just the derivative of the function Chebyshev approx, which I'm going to introduce in just one second, with respect to v, which is this argument over here. Then I take y, I will go to Chebyshev approx in one second. I go to y. I subs is just a function that transforms this from symbolic into numerical. Double, I, I'm sure that I make it a double, so it's double uh, precision. And then what is y? y is the derivative that I just computed plus the Chebyshev approximation because my differential equation is d prime plus d. And what is Chebyshev approx? Chebyshev approx is just the Chebyshev polynomial which is just defining the function Chebyshev over here. This is just the definition of the Chebyshev polynomial. And theta, which is the vector. And this is the vector multiplication, so this is the sum of the, you know, is the linear combination. 
Okay? So it's a bunch of functions, but it's actually, once you think about it, it's very easy. In test, I call residual, non-linear. Non-linear calls residual. Residual calls uh, Chebyshev, uh, uh, just calls Chebyshev approximation, and I build my D prime plus D. So if instead of doing this very simple differential equation, you were solving an RBC, this will be different. This will be the part of the code that will change. Because over here, you will have your Euler equation. But you can see how I will be able to carry forward most of the code that I already did. Okay? I just didn't want to spend a lot of time going over an Euler equation over there. And then if we go back to test, the only thing I'm going to do over there is just plot results. So it's not even, it's not even that interesting. So let me run this. Yes, change folder. Okay. And what I'm plotting you over there is the blue line is the exact solution, the exponential function that I was telling you before. And this green line is the fourth order approximation, the well, third order really, that we computed before. Okay? So this seems to work really, really well. Well, you can say maybe not as well over there. We still have a little bit of a non-trivial difference. Well, something I can do is, and I, I will explain you what I have in test three in just one second. Oh, this didn't work so well. Let me see if I have another figure someplace. No? Why is this? One second, eh? Or maybe test two. Oh, okay. Now, th this was the right one. So what you can see over there now, there are three lines. The blue one is the exact one. The red one is with four. The, sorry, the green one is with four. The red one is with six. And now you see that we are nailing it down. We, is, we are just on top. Okay? So what did I do in test two? How, how I do this much better? Well, I used this iterative procedure I was telling you before. So first of all, I solve the problem with four. And then I take my solution with four is going to be the initial guess with a solution with six, well, the first four anyway, and then I'm just going to put, well, here I put a little bit different from zero just to make it a, a nice example, but I could put here zero and zero. Okay? So that's actually the way I always solve Chebyshev polynomial problems. I first solve the problem with maybe three polynomials. I get the solution. I use this as the initial guess plus a zero for four. I get this for four. And so on and so forth. And the good thing is if you design the code in the way I did it, which is just this, all these different modules and all these different functions, you can do this in a loop. So really the only thing you are doing is putting a loop and you will go to very, very high levels of polynomials in just one second. Yes? <laughs> when I get bored, no, seriously. Uh, again, this depends a little bit of how much accuracy you want given the characteristics of your problem and the speed considerations that you have. So I don't think there is an ex ante uh, uh, criteria that is the best. You can always compute Euler equation errors in each step and see if it's good. They are good enough or not. Okay? But again, remember the point I was trying to mention before. Accuracy is really something that is context dependent. So something that is linearization is usually good enough for computing business cycle statistics, but it's usually not good enough to compute welfare. So it depends on what you want to use this model for. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, in fact, what we do with the Chebyshev polynomials, I, this is a little bit more uh, fancy stuff. We don't really solve for the Euler equation. We solve for the inverse of the Euler equation, where we have already undo the marginal utility, because that problem is much more linear, and that it will everything will work much nicer. 
So Chebyshev polynomials at the end of the day, so I would say that in real life, they have two problems. The first one is that if you really have many dimensions, it's a little bit of a pain to code them because you, know, you need to keep track of all these many, many dimensions. And the second problem is you need to come up with good initial guesses. So a combination of this iterative approach plus you know, a smart transformation of the utility function or the Euler equation will get you out of trouble in most cases. Mm. Okay. So I found that for a lot of the things I use, F solve is good enough. And MATLAB actually tends to be a very serious company. They are really very thorough. So my suspicion is that you are going to have a hard time finding something better than F solve. Okay? Uh, for example, MATLAB is a company, I mean the guy who founded it is was a professor here at MIT. And um, they are always on the frontier on things like number, uh, random number generation. And they really, they, they take these things very seriously. So yeah, maybe you can find something better, but by default, I think that some of the uh, MATLAB code will work very, very well. Okay? Uh, another thing is solving these nonlinear systems of equations is as much of an art as of a science. And you know, at the end of the day, there is nothing like tender love and care in front of the screen of the computer at Saturday nights at 2 at night. But, you know. And uh, what did I do in test 3 to show you this? Oh, and test 3 is exactly the same exercise that I think uh, Larry did yesterday where uh, Again, blue one is exact one, green one is four with collocation, with orthogonal collocation, and the red one is four with uniform grid. And you can see yet in another example how this works much worse. Okay? So let me recap then what you really need to do for Chebyshev polynomials. So basically what you will need to do is you write the equilibrium conditions of your model. Whatever you have the decision rules, you substitute them by these linear combinations of basis functions, which are just the linear combinations of Chebyshev polynomials. That will build the residual function. And my suggestion is, by default, always use orthogonal collocation, which just means you need to solve that residual function exactly at the zeros of the Chebyshev polynomial. So it's not that difficult, it's not as easy as perturbation. I also need to be honest, but it's not that difficult. I think that sometimes people get scared when they hear Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, let me go back to the text and just finish a couple more ideas. Okay, so another method of selecting a basis function is called Galerkin, or sometimes Raleigh Ritz for the guys who came up with this idea back in the 30s. And basically what this guy suggests is that to use as basis fun sorry, as weight functions, the same basis functions that you use for the linear approximation. Extremely accurate and extremely robust. It works really, really well and there is some reasons, some mathematical reasons I'm not going to get into. So if you are going to design a nuclear power plant, or you are going to design a plane, you probably want to use Galerkin. Because the consequences of making a mistake are non-trivial. Now, for what we do in economics, it's probably not needed. Especially because you will need to solve this integral, and solving this integral is a pain. Okay? There will be, in fact, really two integrals. The integral of the residual function already, because you, know, you will have things like expectations and stuff like that, and then this outside integral. Also, as a rule of thumb, people have found, and this is only a rule of thumb, okay? It's not any theorem or anything like that, that orthogonal collocation m plus 1 does usually as well as Galerkin with n. So if I do Galerkin with 10 polynomials and orthogonal with 11, 
In 90% of the cases, you are getting the same accuracy. Now, the problem is if you are designing a nuclear power plant, you don't really want to be in other 5%, where it is not the case. So you really want to be sure that the thing works fine. But you know, for what we do in economics, since I don't think anything will vaporize if we don't get it exactly right, probably going to n plus 1 makes more sense and it's much easier and really, really much faster to compute. OK? Um, questions about this? OK, so this is just a simple example. Uh, now, well, I talked already about uh, how to improve errors and how to refine these things. Uh, I also have a few slides about finite elements. I'm not going to say much about those. Um, because, you know, I, I really think that, you know, by default, uh, Chebyshev polynomials is probably these days uh, a better way, a better way to go. Uh, let me see if I'm missing something else. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Which is, you know, this type of frontiers we were having. So what we did in this paper about the zero lower bound was to solve Instead of solving for the Euler equation, for the decision rules directly, what we used was to parameterize the expectation of the Euler equation tomorrow. And that seemed to have worked quite fine for us. So, but yes, I guess that for finite elements, you could also do some real hard work with it and, and see if you get the same solution. Okay. So let me stop here. I'm finishing five minutes early, so let's reconvene five minutes earlier as well. Uh, because probably for heterogeneous agent models, I, will have, uh, I have a lot of material to cover. But I think by now you should at least have a basic understanding of how to approach perturbation problems and how to approach uh, projection problems. Okay? One, remember, is about Taylor expansions, it's about local, it's about taking derivatives. The other one is about building residuals. You know, advantages and disadvantages of both of them. And just as a brief final thought, in this section, you really want to think about those as menus. It's a menu. Okay? So sometimes you feel like drinking wine, and sometimes you feel like drinking beer. The fact that I'm drinking some wine now doesn't imply I'm against beer. And that's the same way you should think about perturbation versus projection, or any type of linearization, is really the thing that is best suitable for the problem you have at hand. It's not any really use thing that, you know, I did perturbation because I promised my grandmother in her dying bed or anything like that. Okay?